You are listening to Tantibus, a story created by Devon Xeon. And welcome to the fifth chapter. Drenched in sweat and feelings of anguish, Twilight immediately rose up into a sitting stance, nearly sending her sheets over the edge of the bed. This nightmare was by far more intense than the previous Tantibus dream. She tried to make herself relax and slow down her breathing, but the thoughts of the events and the screams from her nightmare remained like markings in her mind, making her dramatic gasp for air persist. Unlike last night, she this time had her nightmare fresh in memory. She grabbed a corner of the bedsheet and had it act as a makeshift cloth, patting her forward, forehead and around her horn with it. Her heart rate started to slow down and enabled her to gather her thoughts. This nightmare had taken a drastic and dark turn with the, mi- with the vivid murder of Donna. It was scarring to see the way she- in which she had collapsed to the floor, motionless, with just her head twitching from the blood pouring out of her throat. The red puddle kept expanding beneath her, soaking into the cracks of the wooden floor. And then there were the screams, the horrified cries and the realization that the challenge had started, with no going back. But there was one pony whose panicked screams vastly outmatched the rest. Despite desperate and heartbreaking cries for mercy that wanted nothing more than to be left alone, those were the screams of the killer himself. Being a spectator and listener of not only his eyes and ears, but also his mind, Twilight was the only other pony to ever hear or see Maverick's sinister side of things in this challenge. Even though his eyes showed a thirst for blood, his mind was breaking down from within. As his puppet body took action, his brain experienced the three common phases that usually every selected Tantibus individual will go through. Phase 1. Confusion. What is happening? I, I, I can't seem to control myself. I can't move. Someone help me! Help! I can't talk either. What is this? Wait, what am I doing? What is happening to me? Phase 2 realization. Oh my goodness, the blade. I'm going to... Oh, please, no. Some bony. Something. Help me. And finally, phase three, desperation. Somebody, please help me. Run. Run away from me, please. Can anybody out there hear me? Please, I'm begging you. They're innocent. They don't deserve to die. Make me kill myself instead. Please, I'm begging you. Please, anybody, help me. While I was there, she could hear him, every word, every scream, and every cry. But just as Maverick was to his actions, Twilight found herself helpless and could do nothing but watch and witness the events unfold. Maverick became the selected contestant. It is an unwritten rule that is put into action almost every Tantibus round. When, whenever some pony's life is at risk, the ponies in his or her immediate vicinity will do anything to save it. This empathy, naturally, causes every, nearly every contestant to refuse competing in the Tantibus challenge. But that is where Tantibus's trick kicks in. As a, final resor- as a final resort to boost the action, one individual will be chosen to start the challenge. They become a puppet. They become the selected. By now, Twilight Sparkle had this figured out as she was comparing the similar actions between those of Maverick and the ones Flaming Ace took when he also claimed to have lost control of his body. Twilight glanced out the small rounded window by her bed. The red sky came marching in the horizon and dawn was on its way. As she turned her head, her eyes met with met her eyes then met her alarm, which was set to go off in about half an hour's time from that point. There is no way I'm going to be able to snooze after that. Twilight Sparkle muttered with her raspy, mourning voice. On steady hoofs, she slowly got out of bed, deactivated her alarm, and went down the stairs. Coming down the stairs, Twilight saw the saddlebag that which she had prepared lying on the small, rounded table. She decided to kill time by going through it one more time. As expected, everything was there, including the one train ticket she had received from Celestia. It was good for one trip to and return from the center of Cantalon. She also caught, got, a gl- got herself a glimpse of Aeon's message one more time. She stopped and looked at it for a while. With Maverick on that murderous path, how the heck did you survive? She put the unpleasant note back in the bag. I guess I'll find out today. 
if he really is located at the Candlelight Ment Mental Institution. Wow. I just cannot get it through my head that he is actually still alive. A living witness. Twilight sealed up the saddlebag and resumed her morning routine by entering the kitchen. She got going with her own breakfast, which was something that she had not counted on actually having the time for. As a result of her abrupt awakening, she did have a few extra minutes at her disposal. A nutritious breakfast later, she finished up her chores for the morning and got ready to head out in the youthful and beautiful morning. Before she left, she trotted over to her number one assistant and gave him a peck on the cheek. What she did not know was that that innocent little kiss would be the last thing she would ever do for her most loyal friend in the world before he were to have his heart irreparably broken. With that done, she went outside, closed, and locked the door. She could now commence her journey to the capital. A small puddle erupted in a splash as the purple hoof stepped off the train. The first step in Camelot for weeks, and it was raining. Luckily, Twilight's errand in the capital were not exactly outside, but she did originally have plans for some sightseeing while she was there. With those plans scratched, she set trail for the mental institution without a moment's delay. She looked up to the sky and saw a few weather ponies managing the clouds, adding moisture to Candlelight's fields. Today of all days, she pretended to yell at them and continued, I guess I'll be saving even more time now. She galloped through the various streets that she had memorized the night before, but after running through a few blocks, she noticed that she had long ago deviated from the path and the near inevitable had happened. She had gotten lost. If this had been a few years prior, Twyla would have no problem at all navigating the city, but years had passed and much recon reconstruction had taken place, mostly to fit in new rails for the trains. The streets still had their names, but this particular street must have been new, as she had not heard its name before. Either that or she was truly lost. Twyla placed herself underneath a nearby awning to take a moment to recuperate. She was surprised at how much could really change during those few years, but after all, this was the capital and the center of the Industrial Revolution. Industrial Evolution. She had even read in the Inquestria Inquirer the other day that researchers at the Canelot Scientific Institute, also known as the CSI, were performing experiments on other ways of conserving lightning than clouds. Just a few centuries ago, poly ponies barely knew how to control clouds in the first place. It truly is fascinating. She glanced across the street and saw a sign. It read Canelot Tourist Agency. Perhaps, perhaps they can provide me with a map and directions? Twyla took off, rushed across the street, and opened the door to the agency. Behind the counter in the store stood a fairly jaded earth pony. The mare had light pink fur with a combed mane. The mane had two different dyes of green, matching her equally green eyes. Her cutie mark was a magnifying glass, usually a sign of curiosity. Can I help you? She spoke gently. Yes, uh, do you have maps of Candlelot? Twilight responded. Of course, this is a tourist agency, isn't it? She said with a giggle and turned around to retrieve a map from the high shelves, which was proving to be difficult. Otherwise, I could do that for you. Twilight offered her help, being a unicorn, but the tourist agent neglected it. Nah, just because I'm an earth pony doesn't mean that I'm completely hopeless. Finally, she knocked the map off of the high shelf and caught it midair. See? Thanks. Twilight received and immediately rolled up the scroll to have a peek. Do you happen to know where the uh, Canelot Mental Institution is? Not the most popular tourist destination, but yes, I do. It is right over here, see? The pink pony marked a cross over a building in the nearby area with a quill. My uncle lives there. Before Twilight could say anything, the mare continued hastily. He's not mad or anything. He is just... It is just that his wife passed away, and he hasn't been feeling all too well about it lately. He, he seems fine, but insisted that he needed the treatment. She looked up at Twilight. If you're going there, say hello to him for me, will you? His name is Luthus Reginard. I will. Don't worry, Twilight assured her. Very fancy name he's got. The agent grinned. <laughs> yeah, I love him. He is like a father to me. My real father is good too, but... He just doesn't seem to care about me as much as Uncle Luthus does. At that moment, she interrupted herself by highlighting Twilight's cutie mark. Your cutie mark? It is an... Uh... Wh what is it exactly? Twilight took the hint and went along with the change of subject. It is a sparkle. After all, my name is Twilight Sparkle. My special talent is performing magic. I'd like to say that I'm pretty good at it, too. Wow! I've always been fascinated by magic and cutie marks my whole life. I mean, 
How does it actually work? I see. Your cutie mark, the magnifying glass, does it mean that you are fond of knowledge? A bit, I guess. But I believe it is more representative of my love for adventures and exploring. You see, that is why I applied to work at a tourist agency. I thought they would allow me to travel and see things. Not just being stuck here as a clerk. I want to see the world. Well, are you interested in legends too? Is it real? I believe it is. Then tell me. Then Twilight told the story of Tantibus and what she knew of it. She also explained her trip and told the cute little tourist agent that she thought that a performer contestant was located at the mental institute. Of course, the light pink earth pony was just thrilled by the mystery. Ah, oh, I'd love to come with you. I really would. It seems captivating. Then she hung her head down submissively. But I can't. My shift doesn't end until closing time. It's just me here today. But I'll check it out later, I promise. That's no problem at all. I have to go now, though. Hey, I didn't catch your name, by the way. Oh, it's Avani. Avani Lace. <laughs> My name is Twi Sparkle. I know that. You already mentioned that, silly. Oh, well. It's been nice talking to you, Avani. Could only say the same, Twilight. And so Twilight left the charming little agency to find the mental, in mental institute and the only Tantibus contestant alive. She also left the last friend she would ever make before staring into the eyes of death. The rain had stopped and it seemed to her that she had been chatting with that clerk for longer than she had originally thought. Avoiding puddles on her way, she resumed her walk towards her destination that was to her surprise not especially far from her current location. It was actually only a couple of minutes later that she had arrived at the old white building. It had a lawn in front of it with a big sign on it that read with large green letters, Canterlot Mental Institute. There was a neat gravel walkway laid out over the grass, leading up to the entrance that she was walking towards. I guess this is it, Twilight whispered gently as she approached the aforementioned entrance, and then went inside. Immediately she found herself in a small lobby. There were not many visitors waiting in this particular lobby this day, luckily, so she would not have to wait for too long. There was a desk far into the room opposite the entrance. It was the first thing you saw as you entered the building. Soon enough, there was no pony at the help desk, so Twilight seized the opportunity to get to her turn. As she arrived, the stallion behind her, behind the desk, inquired, How can I assist you? It was a fully grown stallion with white fur. It reminded her of her own brother, Shining Armor. The mane was lightly red and shortly cut. It suited him quite well, so Twilight figured that maybe it would fit on Shining Armor too. She could not help but to picture her brother with this main cut. I would like to pay a visit to a friend of mine. Fairly disinterested and with a monotonous tone, the stallion responded, Your name? Twilight Sparkle. And whom would you like to visit? He was preparing and signing a slip of paper. Aeon, Twilight replied. The white and red stallion stopped writing and took a closer look at this visitor. It was not normal for Aeon to receive visitors and he had never seen this mare before. But it was not his job to meddle in others' affairs, so he looked back down and wrote Aeon onto the paper. Then he handed it over to Twilight and asked her to sign it. After doing so, she was simply instructed to wait for assistance. She followed the instructions and took a seat in the waiting room. A few quite boring and tedious minutes passed until a big white door opened. A nurse came out and asked for Twilight Sparkle. That's me. Twilight responded and walked out of the lobby through the white door that the nurse so kindly held open. As they were walking through the corridors, Twilight felt relieved that the nurse was by far nicer than the stiff stallion from the waiting room. This was mostly because of the light-hearted conversation she maintained between the two of them. So, what's the reason for your visit? The nurse asked politely. Oh, I'm just an old acquaintance, Twilight lied. She had already told the Tantipa story once today and did not feel like doing it again on such such short notice. Why are you asking? It's just that it's so rare for Aeon to receive visits nowadays, the nurse explained. It's just been months now since his own relatives last visited him as well, you know, since he doesn't talk at all. Yeah, I've heard about that. How do you communicate with him? He has a blackboard and a white chalk that he uses to draw key words and sometimes brief sentences with. But even with that, he doesn't say much. Usually it's only when it comes to important matters such as food or other necessities. 
Any ideas on exactly why he can't talk? Twilight remarked. No one quite knows why. We've had doctors come in and check on him, but nothing physical is off about him. Twilight thought about Tantibus and his experience with it. What about psychological or emotional problems? He could hardly be doing it out of free will when it comes to something as important as speech. The therapists we've had here thinks it's because of something traumatizing that happened a while back. She interrupted herself by declaring, Oh, here we are, Aeon's room. Both the nurse and Twilight stopped in front of the white door. The nurse knocked on the door and said, Aeon, you have a visitor. Isn't that nice? We're coming in, okay? Then she slowly pushed the door open, and Twilight could see the inside of his room. Finally, I have found him. I'm going to talk to him. Twi she was excited, and then at the same time apprehensive of what could happen. What if he broke down? What if he had a heart attack when going back to his memories? Twi took a deep breath and saw Aeon's figure. I'll just have to take it slowly. Aeon had a light blue fur and a light brown mane, just as she remembered him from, her, from the dreams. He appeared as withdrawn as one could expect, and he showed no emotions. As for the room he was inhabiting, it had typical white walls. There was a bed against the wall to, to the right, and a bookshelf by the wall to the left. There was also a door on that left wall, which Twilight assumed led to the bathroom. In the middle of the room, there was a table with an accompanying chair, and on that wall, facing the doorway where Twilight was, she saw a window and a large blackboard. Right now, Aeon was standing up, and drew on the chalkboard with, uh, and drew on the blackboard with a white piece of chalk. Who? Twilight glanced to her right, where she was met with a nurse nodding at her with encouragement. I'm Twilight Sparkle, a friend. Aeon did not move and showed no interest. Twilight started walking towards Aeon. She glanced back at the nurse, who did not really seem to mind, taking it as a validation to pro to proceed. She sat down by the table and reached for her bag. Aeon, I have something that belongs to you. Look. He turned around slowly, still very stiff. Twilight opened the bag and placed an item onto the table, and then began pushing it towards its rightful owner. It was a note. A note he had written. He had written it some time long ago, before he came to this place. It was a message written in blood starting with his signature followed by his death declaration. It was what he thought would be his final words. Aeon glanced up at her with a look of surprise and distress facing the stranger, the first pony to ever see his note. Then the first pony to ever see his note then leaned over and whispered to him, I know what happened to you. <laughs>